Well, hi, thank you guys so much for coming. And it's a real honor to kick off uh, this colloquium. And uh, I can slightly tease me about the fact that I haven't been to Turkey in person yet. I am going to come. I'm, I'm sorry that this has to be my first visit and not even a real visit, but I will. Uh, I do, I do want to come. I'm sure the Iskender kebab is better than it is in Sun Prairie. OK, um, so I'm going to share my screen. I, we tried this right before we started, so hopefully this will work. Um, so I'm going to talk. This is a colloquium talk, so I want to talk in a very uh, general way today about sort of like a whole subject and a whole direction in a very mainstream part of number theory. So inevitably, this is going to involve, I'll say a little bit about a new result of my own at the end, but this is going to primarily be about um, lots of results by lots of people. I'm sure I will leave people out because this is such a big subject that I can only talk about so much. But um, I hope this gives a picture, especially for the uh, non-number theorists of like one of the mainstreams that's going on uh, in this area. So let's just start with the basic question, which in some sense uh, has been the basic question of number theory since number theory began. I give you an equation. What are the solutions? OK, of course, because I'm an algebraic number theorist, that's what I say the basic question is. If you have like Peter Sarnak here, he'll tell you the basic question is how many primes are there in an interval? So I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. But I, to me, the basic question of number theory is I give you an equation. Uh, what are the solutions? Uh, here's an example of an equation uh, that I pulled out of a recent paper. Uh, well, actually, that's not I realize that the way I wrote it, uh, this is not much of an equation. This is the definition. So maybe if I want to make this into a little bit more of a fun equation, let's say that's equal to zero. And by solutions, I'm going to mostly mean with x, y, and z, either integers or rational numbers. There's a lot of things we could mean. And in number theory, we ask about solutions over other fields as well. But let's just start by looking at this and admitting that it seems pretty hard to think of all sets of integers, x, y, and z, making this complicated equation true. Uh, that said, this happens to be an equation to which we do know the solutions. And actually, before I tell you the list, I'll make one little comment about this particular equation. Um, if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that it's what's called homogeneous, which means that every single one of these terms of this giant polynomial I wrote down uh, has degree four. They have different degrees in the different variables, but if you sum up the degrees in all the variables, you get some, you get, you know, it could be x squared, z squared, or just let's see, is there a y to the fourth in there? There is one. Um, uh, and in particular, what that means is that let's say you come up with a solution x, y, z. If I double x and I double y and I double z, so I scale them all, then every single term is going to get multiplied by 16. And similarly, you can multiply by anything. You can multiply by some arbitrary parameter lambda. And each one of these terms will get multiplied by lambda to the fourth, which means the whole sum will get multiplied by lambda to the fourth. But I mean, so if, my, if, you have, if your thing was a solution, so is my rescaled thing. So when we study solutions to an equation like this, we study them. That's why I say only up to scaling. And then ready? OK, here's the answer. There are seven solutions to this equation up to scaling. I wonder if anybody in the audience uh, thought of any of them as we were going. I think the only one you could probably reasonably think of with your naked eye uh, is this one. Because if you set x equal to y equal to 0 and z equals to 1, out of all these crazy terms, the only one that could possibly not be 0 would be z to the fourth, right? Any other possible term is going to have either an x in it or a y in it. And then you kind of let your eyes scan over this whole long polynomial and you see that there is no z to the fourth term. So actually, if you set x equal to y equals to 0, you do get 0. OK, so that's one you might find. And you could probably imagine that by searching on your computer, you could maybe find all seven of these solutions. They happen to be pretty small, so it wouldn't take that long. Uh, but of course, how would you know you were done? Right? How do you know there's not um, some solution in very, very large integers uh, to this equation that you just missed in your computer search? And you know, that's why there's a whole subject of Diophantine geometry, the study of solving these so-called Diophantine equations and in integers, um, which is not just like asking your computer what the answer is. Um, this particular equation was, yeah, it took five people to do this. So you know it's hard, right? It's a, it's a wonderful paper. 
um, of Balakrishnan, uh, Natan Dogra, Stefan Mueller, Tweetman, and Dion Vonk uh, from 2019. Um, and you might ask, like, did they just like wake up one morning and like decide to write down this particular equation and like get five people together and write a paper about it? Um, no, this is actually a famous equation. It's called the cursed curve. Um, again, in this talk, there's so many roads that are interesting that we won't follow. Um, I'll just say it is, so I, I've written, as you can see, I've written a lot of stuff in advance and then I'll write stuff as I go. It is uh, a modular curve of level 13, these are a certain kinds of, um, these are special curves which parameterize, uh, well, they parameterize other curves, they parameterize elliptic curves. Um, on the one hand, they're sort of some of the most important equations, they, they're, their solutions actually have a meaning. These solutions correspond to sort of certain elliptic curves which are special in some way. Um, also, because these curves are special, they have more structure and so you have more of a chance to actually prove something. So I will emphasize that if I wrote down, if I just like change these coefficients and wrote down some other equation that looked like this but with different coefficients, um, there's some set of standard methods that might work to allow you to compute all of its solutions, but we know those don't work for all curves. And if they didn't, you would probably just be out of luck or it would be a problem of equivalent difficulty. It would take five other very strong number theorists like these to sort of sit down and write this paper. So this is a problem that in some sense, we just don't have that much purchase on. Well, I always like to start with the most pessimistic view. So having said that, having said that the problem is really hard, um, I want to kind of now tell you a, like a long story about sort of what we know about it and what new things we're coming to know just in the last few years. Um, and I also want to say, of course, that like modular curves is something I've thought about in my life. And uh, Ekin wrote a wonderful thesis, which was in part about studying exactly uh, rational. We steer away from the cursed curve. The, curved, the cursed curve was not in Ekin's thesis, but on many uh, rational points over many fields, over many modular curves and their twists. Um, OK, so oh, yeah, so I, I mentioned this. A natural question here, if you're not used to this style of geometry, is why am I calling this a curve when this is an equation in three variables? One equation in three variables, right? When we teach multivariable calculus, that's a surface. OK, and the issue is precisely um, because of this issue of scaling, because I really think of x, y, and z, and 2x, 2y, 2z, or negative x, negative y, negative z, as the same point. So for those uh, who are used to it, it means I'm just working in the projective space of dimension 2, not affine space of dimension 3. But quite concretely, if I only care about x, y, z up to scaling, then I really only have two degrees of freedom. And then by imposing this uh, equation, I'm down to one degree of freedom. And that's why it's a curve. That's why the solution set I think of as a one dimensional thing. Um, so one way of thinking of a sort of a quick and dirty way of thinking of this ambiguity up to scaling is, well, I'll just divide everything by z. Like instead of x, y, z, I'll just think of uh, x over z, y over z1, and say, I'm just going to assume z equals 1. And now I'm in something that looks like a plane. I just have, instead of three integers, I have two rational numbers. There are issues. Right, like mainly what if z was zero? So you have to be a little bit careful about stuff like that. But uh, for the moment, I'm going to kind of pretty freely go between these two points of view. And now, I mean, um, I called this subject dive geometry. I didn't do anything that seems very geometric yet. So, um, but we can sketch pictures, right? So here's here's my picture. Uh, if I set z equals to one and study the solutions to q of x y one equals zero and r. That's an equation in two variables. And if you plot it, I mean, you could literally, I mean, maybe I should have done this, type it into Desmos or something. Didn't think of it. Okay. Uh, maybe next time I talk about this, I'll do it. Um, and you would just get, I don't know, some one dimensional region in R. And we sort of know what one manifolds look like. They look something like this, I guess. Um, and it might sort of chunk up into different pieces or something like that. So it would look something like this. On the other hand, if I looked at the complex solutions, then I would get something which is one dimensional over the complex numbers. And that's a little bit harder to draw because the complex plane, it's like a one dimensional, it, it's like one degree of freedom as a complex number. But of course, when we draw a picture of it and look at it with our eyes, that's 
two-dimensional. It's the complex plane. So the set of solutions to this equation over the complex numbers is a one-dimensional complex manifold, which is a two-dimensional real manifold. And those have a little more geometry to them. That can look like some funny kind of surface. Um, and in fact, this one, I did not use Desmos and I have no idea what the real solutions to that equation actually look like. I should have looked it up. This one, I actually do happen to know that the complex solutions of this equation look like this um, because I know that this curve is a so-called curve of genus three. And the genus is an algebraic invariant, which, I mean, there's so many ways to think of it. It's fundamental to the study of algebraic curves. But one way to think of it is I look at all the complex solutions to the equation and they form some two-dimensional manifold. And you can check that that manifold is orientable. So it's not some crazy like Klein bottle or something like that. Um, if the curve doesn't have any singularities, which is something else you can check algebraically, you know it's like a smooth. Well, I, oh, I said manifold already. So I, I should have said smoothness first. Okay, once it's smooth, it's an orientable two-dimensional manifold. And good news, if there's topologists in the room, I know Barish is here at least, we understand exactly what those are, right? They're the, um, the surfaces of various genera. Genus zero is a sphere, and then genus G is a donut with, with G holes. Um, and this particular curve is a, is a curve of genus three, and so it looks something like this. And maybe again, if for the non-topologists, you know, I could have also drawn it like this. It does, I mean, these are topologically all the same uh, surface. I could deform one into the other. Okay. So let's now return to like, what is the basic problem? I give you an equation, maybe a homogeneous equation in variables x naught through xn, star. And then I want to find all the rational points, all the solutions x naught through xn in integers. So that's the problem that was solved for the cursed curve. And as I hope I've already conveyed, that problem is too hard. In fact, in some completely formal way, another story I'm not going to tell is the story uh, is the story that took place kind of in the uh, in the 60s, where we even showed in some formal sense this was not even a computable problem. So that is like not something I uh, I'm going to go into. But there's even some sort of formal complexity theory sense in which this problem is definitively too hard. Okay, so what are we going to do? Give up? No, we're going to make it easier. So well, let's ask a sort of lighter question. What if I say, okay, I don't want to find all the solutions, but I want to know how many solutions there are. That seems like a good idea, but guess what? Still too hard, it turns out. Actually, I don't know if anyone has proven anything on the sort of decidability side for that problem, but I would say generally people think just as hard. Okay, anybody remember the title of my talk? I know it was a long time ago, it was Upper Bounds. Okay, we're still whittling down our problem and making it easier until it's something we can say something about. Um, so what if we ask, Okay, can we at least tell whether there's finitely many solutions or infinitely many solutions? Like in the example that I gave at the beginning of the talk of the cursed curve, there were just those seven solutions. That was the case where the number of solutions was finite. Um, even that is still too hard in general. Although at least it's in the realm where there are sort of believable conjectures, which I may mention like due to Lang. Well, no, even that, maybe that's, maybe that's too much to say. Um, I should say, by the way, although here you're starting to know something, because there are cases where we can guarantee infinitely many solutions. For instance, if I were to write down, um, so e.g., f of some polynomial uh, let's say I wrote a cubic. Okay, that seems hard. How do I know whether there's solutions? But let's say n is like, you know, like 100 billion or something. Okay, if I have enough variables, I, maybe I hope that there's even some feeling that, boy, if I had that many variables, it seems like that would make it easier to find solutions. And indeed, there's yet another whole story I'm not gonna tell that comes from the so-called hardy littlewood circle method in analytic number theory, where if the number of variables is really, really large compared to the degree of the polynomial equation, then you can guarantee that there are infinitely many solutions and even get good asymptotics for like how many solutions there are of a given size. So that's not so much a story I'm gonna tell today, but I wanna, we're sort of getting into the zone where we can start to say some stuff. Okay. 
let's make this problem easier still. I just said, I said, okay, there's something we can say if you have like a hundred million variables. Um, but that's kind of hard to think about. Maybe it seems easier to think about fewer variables like three. Why not two you ask? Because remember, because of this sort of issue of things being defined up to scaling, uh, three variables is like a one dimensional solution space. That's like the sort of smallest, really interesting case from this point of view. So let's cut down to three and now let's call them X, Y, and Z instead of X, not X, one and X, two. Okay, so I have X, F of X, Y, Z equals zero. And I'm still asking this modest question of, are there finitely or infinitely many solutions? And now at last we get to a place where there's like a big theorem. And sometimes the theorem that really like jump started the subject again uh, in the eighties uh, for my time, I'm not that old yet. Okay, so I, but, uh, but fall things proved in 1985 and, and a criterion for when there were finitely many solutions on a curve and when there were infinitely many solutions on a curve. And the answer comes down to exactly this issue of drawing the complex manifold of solutions um, and seeing what it looks like topologically. Um, maybe I should say to make this simple, uh, so here's three ways that could look. And one thing I haven't said is like, I want this F to be smooth, which is something that you could check algebraically, but in terms of this picture, it just means that uh, if you draw the complex points, the complex solutions to this equation, they actually do form a manifold that doesn't have any, uh, you don't, you don't want it to like, maybe I'll draw it in another color. Um, you don't want it to look like this or something like that with a, with a pinch point. But I promise there's a way to deal with it. That's, a, that's sort of a non-generic case. And I promise there's a way to deal with it if it looks like that too. Most of the time, it's gonna look like, as we said, uh, an orientable surface. And we know what those are and they're classified by their genus. And what Fall things showed is that if that surface is a sphere, then uh, there are either infinitely many solutions or there are no solutions. And actually the question of which it is turns out to be like pretty elementary. Um, it, it, there's a sort of relatively easy finite computation you can do to figure out whether it's infinitely many or none. Um, on the other side, if you have a uh, genus greater than one, more than one whole, uh, then, and this is really the big part of Faulting's theorem, uh, there are only finitely many solutions. That's amazing. Um, and finally, of course, there's this kind of liminal case. The cases on the boundaries are always very interesting, where the genus is exactly the one. These are the so-called elliptic curves that, as you probably know, number theory has spent a lot of their time thinking about. And here, it actually could be either. There's elliptic curves with only finitely many rational points, and there's elliptic curves with infinitely many rational points. And there's an incredibly rich study of what's going on at the boundary. But again, like this side of it was already pretty well understood pre faultings And this is what was new, that you could get this general finiteness statement, which you can think of as an upper bound, I guess, like strictly less than infinity. Um, so, so for example, that cursed curve that we discussed at the beginning, um, it was not until the good work of Balakrishnan at all that we knew what the solutions to that equation were. But by fall things, we knew there was only finitely many solutions. We just didn't know what they were. And we didn't have an upper bound for how many there were, except that it was finite. Uh, and then those folks were able to exactly write down what the solutions were. Um, OK. Now I'm going to change course a little bit um, and seemingly address the same question again. Uh, how many points can a curve have? That's the question that we're studying, right? Um, which we seem to have in some sense just answered or at least gotten a lot of information about from faultings. Um, but I do need a little notation. Okay, so if I have a rational point in the plane, so it just has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and I'm gonna write them as A over C and B over C. And of course you might say like, well, what if they don't have the same denominator? Okay, well, I can give them the same denominator, right? By, by finding a common denominator, that's okay. Um, and having done so, I define the height of that point to be the maximum of the absolute value of A and the absolute value of B and the absolute value of C. So if you like, this is sort of a good notion of the complexity of a point. And maybe it's worth saying that 
in particular, how many points are there on the plane of height at most B? Uh, not too many. Number of points x, y. If height at most B, well, you basically are letting A range between B and negative B, little b range between B and negative B, and little c range between B and negative B. So this is on order B cubed. And you might say, like, maybe it's 8B cubed. OK, we're not going to worry about constants in this talk. I'm not being technical. You might worry about, do I require things to be relatively prime? Like, yes, I probably should. All of these things are going to go into the constant. And what we're worried, what we're interested in is like the rate of growth. And in particular, I just want to emphasize, this is sort of a straightforward, but it's important. So I just want to say it outright. There's only finitely many points of height and most B. So in particular, if I ask how many solutions are there to some equation of height and most B, it's a subset of these B squared things, so it's some number. So the finite this question goes away if I bound the height. I say, like, how many points are there of height at most B? Here's a wonderful theorem, one of my favorites, uh, by Roger Heath Brown from 2004. He says, let C be an irreducible curve. And I wrote it this way because I always forget to say irreducible. So I'm sort of like emphasizing that I forgot to write it when I wrote these slides and then put it in, and I'll say why we need it. Um, so it's just the solutions to some equation f of x, y equals 0 in the plane. And let's say this polynomial has degree d. Uh, then the number of rational points of c with height at most b, which I just told you is a finite number, is at most some constant times b to the 2 over d plus epsilon. And actually, it, it took a while, but um, Miguel Walsh in 2015 was actually able to remove this epsilon that was present in Heath Brown. So maybe in its modern formulation, we would say actually just um, c times b to the 2 over d. So as b gets bigger and bigger, and you look at more and more points, um, you, I mean, this gives you some bound on the order of growth. I mean, there's, there's b cubed points of height b in the plane. So this is like pretty few of them, right? Because 2 over d is a lot smaller than 3. On the other hand, let me note that if C is a smooth curve, which most curves are, then the genus of C is given by this formula, 1 half times D minus 1, D minus 2. So a very high degree curve is typically going to have very high genus. It's not obvious, by the way. It's like a consequence of the adjunction formula, but it's something you can compute. So that, on first glance, makes this theorem look pretty weak. But we know that Heath Brown would not have written this paper and like put it in the annals if it was a weak theorem. So let's think about it a little bit more and try to figure out what it's saying. Um, before I do that, let me do one example. It's good to sort of see an actual example. Here's a very easy example. Suppose, um, I don't know, let's say like, um, let's do D equals one, just to sort of see that we're getting sort of something that's roughly correct. Uh, what's a degree one equation? How about like X plus Y equals zero? OK, so our rational solutions to this, that's a pretty easy equation to solve, right? I can just let x be whatever I want. Let's let it be a, and then y has to be negative of that. And now to be of height less than b, uh, we need the absolute value of a and the absolute value of c. It better both be less than capital B. OK, so I have b squared choices, and 2 over 1 is 2. So good, that's correct. <laughs> so there, that's sort of a witness that this bound is, is sharp. And actually, I will leave it as a fun exercise if you want to, uh, to write down a degree d equation that has around b to the 2 over d point of height of most b. Um, but on the other hand, if c is a smooth curve, which most curves are, the genus is this, which you can check for yourself. Once d is 4 or bigger, this number is bigger than 1. So, which is bigger than one, once D is bigger than or equal to four. So in, for those values of D, it may seem that Heath Brown's theorem doesn't say very much because you know that in fact, by fault things, there's only finally many points, no matter how big you let the height get. So it seems like you're saying, how quickly does the number of points of bounded height grow with, as, as capital B grows, when really, thanks to Gerd Faltings, we know it doesn't grow. OK, what's the point? The point is the thing that I wrote in red. Like, why did I write this D in red? Oh, that's a little hard for you to get. 
because the constants here do not depend on the curve. This is what's called a uniform bound. So constant, I'm writing in red to match, constant only depends on D not on the curve. So that's qualitatively very different. Faultings will tell you if I look at like a genus three curve, faultings will tell you there's only finitely many points. But it could be that, you know, this curve has one point and this curve, like the curve curve has seven points and this curve has 500 points and this curve has 16 million points. There's no uniform bound. The, the number of points depends on what the curve is. In Heath Brown, it doesn't matter what the curve is. The same bound works for any curve of that degree. So it's kind of worse, but it's better. It, it, it grows with B, which is worse than faultings, but it doesn't grow as the curve changes, which is better than faultings. So they're, they're sort of orthogonal results to each other and they're both very strong. But of course, because we're mathematicians and we're greedy, you could ask, why can't we have both? Why can't we have everything we want? Maybe we can have the finiteness and the uniformity, the good parts of faultings plus the good parts of Heath Brown. So let's just let's just take a, a slide to investigate that question. Could there be finiteness and uniformity? So there's a wonderful theorem of Caparasso, Harris, and Mazur, which says if the Lang conjecture holds, guys, I'm not going to tell you what the Lang conjecture says today, but it's like a massive generalization of faultings theorem uh, to higher dimensional varieties. Except when I say generalization of a theorem, it's not a theorem. It's a wild conjecture. Um, but if that is true, then in fact, there is some constant depending only on G such that every genus G curve has a most that many points. So, so in other words, we would be in this paradise where there is an absolute upper bound that depends only on the genus. Um, by the way, you can definitely check that this is as good as you can do. You can certainly, if you let the genus get higher and higher, you can certainly get more and more points. That's not so hard to show. So, this looks a little bit abstract, so let me just pin this down. Okay, if I write down a curve of the form y squared equals some sextic polynomial like this, it turns out that every genus two curve looks like this. So um, this can look a little abstract. I'm like, okay, you graph the complex points and there's some manifold and you study its topology. Let me just emphasize that in reality, we're doing stuff we can type into our computer. We can just say y squared equals some sextic. Um, and then the question is, what is, is there a maximum number of solutions over the rational numbers an equation like this can have? Um, thanks to faultings, before him, we didn't even know that. Thanks to faultings, we know there's only finally many, but how many can there be? Um, and we don't know. I think as far as I could tell, and this always changes, but as far as I can tell, the record remains 588. There's an example due to Michael Stoll of an equation of this form, which has 588 solutions. It took a long time to find. Actually, if I remember right, I think he wrote a paper being like, I found a I found a curve with 576 solutions. And then no monkeys no, found 12 more <laughs> after after that paper was out. Um, and I'm not actually even sure we know that that's the total list of points on that curve. I should have checked. In any event, that's the best record we know. But it could be that there's some curve there's some sextic polynomial out there with monstrously large coefficients, you know, which has like for for like six billion different values of x takes a value which is a perfect square. We just do not know. Um, and maybe I'll comment as sort of a little piece of math history. When this paper came out, I mean, as as Ekin mentioned, Barry Mazur was my advisor, and this paper came out when I was in grad school. Um, and this was seen as evidence against the Lang conjecture. Because I think people thought this was pretty ridiculous. People was like, well, come on, you, you have the entire world of like degree six polynomials to work with. Surely you can write down some sequence of degree six polynomials where this equation has more and more solutions as you make the polynomials get more and more complicated. I think this was seen by these guys as like, this is like some kind of like a math Olympiad type problem. Like all you grad students, like somebody go out and like write down this list of polynomials. So we all tried uh, and then none of us can do it. And there was a real spirit of like, let's defeat Lang. You know, like Lang was at Yale, we were at Harvard, you know, it was very important to 
win the big game. But uh, but no, in the end, like none of us could come up with an example. And I think that people having tried pretty hard to do this, it has gone from being seen as a way to disprove Lang's conjecture as I wouldn't go so far as to say evidence for Lang's conjecture, but now people see this as like a reasonable thing that might be true. And I'll give some more reasons for that too. Anyway, so I circle, I, I, I circle this because this is supposed to be like a big if. Like Lang's conjecture is not like the Riemann hypothesis. It's definitely not something that everybody agrees is definitely true, um, but it survived this assault on it at any rate. Um, so we certainly don't know this, but I will say there is a wonderful result from just last year from uh, Bessel and Dimitrov and Philip Habegger and Xiang Gao, which shows that the number of points is bounded by some constant depending only on G raised to some power, which is one more than the so-called Mordal Vey rank. Okay, again, a whole story I'm not gonna tell about the Mordal Vey theorem and the Jacobians of curves, but let me just say that this is a numerical invariant of the curve, which is very computable. Um, and which is often pretty small. Um, and so if it were the case, the Mordell Bay rank that this constant were, were also bounded in terms of G, then you would be done, right? Because then this would be a uniform bound depending only on G. And that's something that I think people again think is like not unreasonable, but we have no idea uh, how to prove it. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll make a, I'll add a remark here. So is rho bounded in terms of G? We certainly don't know that. And this is actually another area where I, I feel like I'm just like telling lots of tales out of number theory history here, where even in the case G equals one, is the, that elliptic curve, is this quantity bounded? I think everybody would have said, no, it should be unbounded. People were sort of discovering like higher and higher rank genus one curves. Um, I think Andrew Granville was alone in saying like, I don't know, I think maybe it should be bounded. And then there was a very influential paper that came out about five years ago by, am I gonna remember all the authors, Bjorn Poonin and uh, Melanie Matchett Wood and John Boyd and Jennifer Park, I think I have them all. Um, that actually made us a, a fairly convincing heuristic argument for why we should think that in the case of genus one, this quantity was bounded above uh, for all curves over Q, which maybe makes an affirmative answer to this question um, more believable. Um, and I'll also just comment another paper sort of in the same vein uh, by Katz, Rabinoff, and, and David Zurich Brown from 2016 shows that if rho is small enough, smaller than g minus three, well, so certainly then this newer result would tell you that there was some bound only in terms of g, but they actually give a very explicit bound. This is a great theorem that if the rank is smaller than g minus three, then the number of points is at most this explicit polynomial in g, which I actually, the Dimitrov Hopiker Gao paper is pretty new, and I looked through to see if they say explicitly what their CG is, and I couldn't find it. But unless it's really small, this is a stronger bound than this one. Um, and I would guess it's not that small. So, um, and I bring this up only because it's yet another story I'm not going to tell, but if you're interested in the subject, that this is kind of pushing forward in the direction of, of Shaboti which is a very wonderful way in practice to get an upper bound in the number of points of a given equation. It doesn't always work, unfortunately, and people have just steadily, including myself and my student Daniel Hast and many other people, been sort of working to push forward uh, the realms in which it does work. Um, and I'll just say that that's also the methods that Balakrishnan, et cetera, use for the cursed curve. They, they push forward a sort of super souped up version of Shabuti's method developed by Minyoun Kim uh, in order to finally settle what the solutions to that equation were. So the summary of this whole discussion is there are uniform bounds where we don't get finiteness and there's finite bounds where we don't get uniformity. The dream is that we'll someday get uniform finite bounds and we're definitely making progress towards that, but uh, we don't have that. And if somebody proves it, I about it. Um, so 
One I want to say, though, I, I want to make one other important distinction in these two theorems, besides that they sort of say different things, which is that Heath Brown's theorem is a lot easier. Faulting's theorem is really hard. I once gave a whole semester topics course that was going to be about the proof of that. And I still don't think I, I can, I don't think you were here yet. I think it was before you came. Anyway, I didn't even finish the proof really in a whole semester. It uses a lot of stuff. Um, Heath Brown's result, on the other hand, is like a basically like a very ingenious application of linear algebra. It's what he calls the determinantal method. Um, in a different kind of talk, I would sketch it for you. I think I'm not going to do that today, but I just want to emphasize that it doesn't use the kind of heavy technical machinery that faultings and um, and all the subsequent things to faultings use. It's much. It, it doesn't use the technical machinery that Chabot does. It doesn't use uh, very much at all. And you know, it's as is pretty common. Um, the the less technical machinery you use, the more general the domain of application. So one thing that 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 follows from that, or that is a result of that, is that this method actually can say something about higher dimensional varieties. In some sense, Faulting's method can say something about a very limited class of higher dimensional varieties, if you care, like varieties, which are sub varieties of a billion varieties, but pretty much it's about curves. Like to the point that I would say it's almost true that there are no surfaces where you can say that there's finally many points, except for these very, very limited cases. Um, so you can say something about higher dimensional varieties, but the thing you can say is a bit weaker. So some of this is in Heath Brown's paper and some of it is in a follow-up paper by, by uh, Niklas Broberg from about a year later. Um, okay, this is, my, this is my picture of a surface. Sorry, I know that uh, the picture is pretty bad, but the red thing is supposed to be a, a, an algebraic surface. And you'd like to say, okay, I can show that there are not so many points of height of most B. And you can't quite show that. What you can show is that, um, so can show the points of height of most B lie on, I think it's like, yeah, B to the three over root D curves of controlled degree. So you don't get a bound for the number of points, you get a bound for the number of curves. And then on each one of these curves, then maybe you're stuck. There could be like as many points as you want, but at least you get some control over where the points are. Um, so let me close by saying, uh, I'll say something about a brand new paper that we just posted. I mean, it's sort of in this vein. Um, and actually, I, we're, we're good. Oh, I can, did you want me to go to the end of the hour or just to 1050, actually? What's your, what's your protocol? It's the first talk, so I guess we're inventing the protocol as we go. Okay. Um, Okay, okay. I, didn't... Sorry, I couldn't I couldn't mute myself. That was a problem. <laughs> you have oh. 15 minutes, but since we started late, you can go a few minutes more. Okay, so what I wrote in my slides is just the statement of the theorem. And I think I'll say like a word about the proof, which I'll write as we go. So this is a theorem of myself, Brian Lawrence and Akshay Venkatesh uh, that we just posted in the archive about a month ago. And here's what it says. Uh, let's think about, we've been talking a lot about homogeneous forms. Uh, so let's say F is a homogeneous form of degree D in N variables. Here's one I just wrote down at random. Let's see, this has four variables and it's of degree four. So I guess this would be like uh, N equals D equals four. Um, and a the fundamental invariant of such a form is its so-called discriminant, which is some kind of crazy polynomial in the coefficients of this form. Uh, and I'm not gonna write down what it is because it depends on N and D. Well, I'm gonna write it down in one case in a second. I'll just say it's called the discriminant because it distinguishes singular varieties from non-singular varieties. So basically this, this discriminant is non-zero if and only if when you grab all the complex solutions to this equation, you get a manifold, you get something that's non-singular. It's kind of amazing that there's an algebraic way that sees this actually, but so there is. And I just wanna emphasize that Although this is sort of some kind of complicated thing that works for any N and any D, it is a thing that you know in the case where N equals D 
equals two, so there's two variables and the degree is two, so a binary quadratic form, ax1 squared plus bx1 x2 plus cx2 squared. This is the thing you know, this is b squared minus four ac, the very thing you always call a discriminant, right? When we're teaching uh, elementary mathematics. So this is some kind of like vastly souped up uh, version of that. And indeed, did I write it down? Oh, let me draw a little picture. Like for instance, if you, if you have, like what if your equation was like x1, x2 equals zero. So b equals one and a equals, uh, actually let me, uh, I'm going to mess this up if I try to do this on the fly. Sorry. Um, let me not do this. Okay. So, so here's the question. The question is how many forms are there with a fixed discriminant? I wrote seven. I could have written M just like any fixed integer. Um, so I want to write down, and it might seem like there's, a lot, right? Because um, there's a lot of different, I mean, and indeed being big, there's a lot of different forms you can write down of a given uh, degree, but actually there's a conjecture and I put Shaparevich in quotes because really Shaparevich's conjecture was more specific than this. And people talk about conjectures of Shaparevich type. I don't think he particularly said this. What actually expects there are only finitely many, only finitely many. We don't prove that. And I think that's very far away. Um, but what we do prove is that if you restrict the coefficients to be of size at most b, so this is kind of like a height thing in the sense of Heath Brown, that it grows more slowly than any power of b. So we call this we call this uh, sparsity, meaning um, it's not quite finiteness. But at least there's not at least the number is very few. This is kind of similar, by the way, to what happens in that sort of a case of genus one curves, which if you think back to faultings, right, it was on that border between when it had to be infinite and when it had to be finite. Um, you can have infinitely many points on an elliptic curve, but the number of height at most b uh, grows more slowly than any power of b. In fact, in that case, it's bounded by a power of log of b, which we think might be true here, but we don't have results good enough to pin down exactly uh, what kind of growth this is. Um, so maybe I'm just going to conclude. I think I will take two more minutes, Ekin, and sort of say one thing about what kind of result this is. Um, so you'll notice that this result, why did I write all this garbage into the C to emphasize that this is not uniform. For instance, it depends on, um, oh, sorry. I. Maybe I should say, um, let's actually just write M and then this definitely depends on M. So this is not uniform. I change the equation, I get a different bound. But the key step is to use these uniform bounds of Heath Brown's type and in particular of Broberg's generalization. And I'll just sort of give a sense of how this works with an analogy. And I won't even say how it works in this sense. So analogy, suppose you were trying to solve the equation u times v times u minus v equals, I don't know, two to the alpha, three minus beta. A very classical kind of Diophantine equation. Um, and I hope you'll agree that there's actually something kind of subtle about this because for this to be true, Okay, so u needs to only have prime factors two and three. V needs to only have prime factors two and three. We can certainly arrange that, but then their difference also has to have only prime factors two and three. So you're mixing addition and multiplication. That's where all the difficulty in number theory comes from. Um, there are interesting solutions to this, right? Maybe you guys have thought of some already, like for instance, uh, u equals nine, v equals eight works, right? Because their difference is one, that's very convenient. Um, to be honest, I just, uh, I didn't even write down what all the solutions of this particular equation were. I just want to tell you, we know there's finally many. This is an example of what's called the S unit equation. And the finiteness was proved by Ziegler. So this is much older than Faulting's. I just want to say something about the natural method of proving this. Um, so approach, we know that U, it's only prime factors can be two and three. And I'm going to use that in the following way, U, is either, maybe u is a perfect square. Maybe it's not. 
Okay. But it's either a perfect square or twice a perfect square or three times a perfect square or six times a perfect square. Because you know, U is two to the M times three to the N and M is either even or odd and N is either even or odd. And depending on the, that, there's sort of four choices and depending on the parity of M and N, it tells you which one of these cases you're in. So, so you have a, and the same for V. So you could think of this equation, maybe a U and V are both squares. And now I have U squared V squared. Oh, maybe I shouldn't call them uh, U and V anymore. I guess if, uh, how about M and N? So maybe it's M squared N squared times M squared uh, minus N squared uh, equals something. Uh, or it could be 2m squared n squared times 2m squared minus n squared or something. Or maybe it's uh, n that's twice a square and then it would be like this. Um, but the point is there's finitely many choices. <laughs> and uh, it's a very, very common move in this kind of study to say, we can trade a single equation of low degree for many equations of higher degree. So sorry, I realized as I write this that maybe it was like, I, I launched into this, but I didn't say what these things were equal to. So sorry, I gotta like sort of be slightly vague about that. But the strategy is often you can sort of trade this for this. And if you can solve a whole bunch of equations of high degree that allows you to solve this single equation of lower degree, um, it's not obvious that that helps you, right? Because it always seems to have like more work to do because you have more equations to solve. But I'll just say that that is the essence of our strategy here. And what we use, if you go back to the way this kind of Heath Brown Broberg stuff looks, is that these bounds get better as the degree gets large. Notice that you're dividing by, well, in this case, root D, in the case of a n-dimensional variety, it would be like D to the one over N. But if you use this kind of argument to make D bigger and bigger, you have more and more, you have a whole big boatload of equations, each one of which you have some decent control of its solutions by this kind of argument. And then what's absolutely critical is, because you have no control over what these equations are, but the bounds you get on their solutions don't care what the equations are. They're completely uniform. So that's absolutely critical. And these results, um, they, all they care about is the degree of the equation. They don't care what the equation is. And that's what allows us to kind of sum the solutions over all those equations uh, and get a decent bound uh, here. So, okay, we're at 1056. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to lead off this colloquium and uh, and I'll be back.